Okay, HFL uh, 240 class. Welcome to Smoke and Fire Dampers module. Um, a critical asset that every HFL needs to understand. Um, looks like, um, you know, I know that we have touched on dampers a little bit through statement of condition. You certainly have crossed over it in some of our codes and standards discussions. Um, and smoke and fire dampers, while it, on one hand they seem, it seems kind of a simple subject and it seems pretty obvious, um, for most organizations um, this is still a very complex issue. It's complex because, you know, it's really one of those out of sight, out of mind issues. Um, I'm amazed um, at the two facilities that I had care over, um, how many issues I found with smoke and fire dampers um, decades after they had been installed and decades after they had been, um, I guess, um, evaluated, maintained, and inspected. And I think that sometimes, to be candid, there's just a lack of due diligence um, that occurs uh, many times. And I think it's because um, it's, a, it's a combination of things. I, I would think education is, a, is part of it. I think prioritization would be another issue related to it. Um, and then I think too that sometimes you do have um, contractors out there that um, don't necessarily have the best trained folks um, or they're, they're, they're contracting or you have the kind of contracts that are not written in such a way that truly hold the vendors accountable for, um, you know, for the work that they do. I, I do know, and I think all of us know in the profession, that uh, again, uh, everything it seems is getting more and more attention when it comes to codes and regulations in healthcare. I think that has something else to do with it. I think in the past, um, you know, the issues with dampers, while they would be found, uh, they're, they're not severe enough to, quote, seriously um, damage the organization as far as receiving money or things like that. Uh, things are changing. I mean, they're they're giving you fewer, fewer, fewer um, uh, issues um, before they start threatening your accreditation um, as time has gone on, and, and then I mean, they're looking a lot harder. So I think as time has has moved on, um, I think that uh, it seems like everything that we have to do in healthcare is becoming um, more difficult and more focused on. And smoke and fire dampers are, are on that list. Although, uh, to be candid, we, you know, we, we are getting better in our profession over probably the last decade or more on this issue. Um, I know that in the facilities that I was in, you know, maintaining better inventories, holding contractors more accountable, um, identifying the, um, you know, the individual um, items, and then raising and training, uh, you know, I'm sorry, uh, raising the awareness and training staff and their knowledge was also an important part. But again, I, I still believe we have, we have a ways to go. And for those of you who have new facilities, while in most cases that's a very, very good thing because uh, you have the ability to sort of create a baseline. Um, and in some cases, unless the building is commissioned well, um, you can still find a number of issues when it relates to new construction and, and smoke and fire dampers. It does seem that we are um, destined to continue to keep learning the same lessons over and over again as the industry goes through transitions of, you know, um, new, new codes, compliance, and also new, new, new technicians that come into the industry that have to start over and gain experience. So uh, this section of smoke and fire dampers, again, this is uh, one of those uh, assemblies, uh, one of those modules we're going over to get a, a more thorough understanding. Um, and we're going to touch on a couple subjects here, try to, to define what they are. Uh, we're going to touch on, you know, smoke partitions, smoke barriers, and firewalls. And we're going to look at a couple examples as we go through. So I really do hope that, uh, you know, again, that this, as we have gone through these courses and as you've gained more experience through these courses and have you gained uh, more experience in your career, uh, that this becomes something that's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. I, I really get it. Because for most folks, they still really don't get it. And it does seem to take quite a bit of time. So what is a fire damper? Um, well, it prevents the passage of fire through a duct opening or air opening in a fire rated wall. And it can be installed both vertically, again on the wall, or horizontally on the floor. I hope uh, you've watched that video that shows a fire damper uh, being tested. Uh, really amazing at the intensity 
of the fire that it can absorb and and block and then of course um, even after it was done when they cooled it um, it was intact so pretty pretty amazing what a fire damper is capable of and the level of protection that it provides it's made up of a couple of components it's not a real complex device but it has a sleeve um, a curtain blade uh, breakaway joints and I, I think we may talk about that more but the breakaway joints are specific to uh, the ductwork being tied to it a fusible link uh, that melts at 165 degrees Fahrenheit and again this is kind of a critical distinction because uh, when we get to smoke and combination dampers um, they're not driven you know fire dampers are driven by generally fusible links um, if they're just a, a basic or a, a fire damper only um, and they and again they're they're um, one of the actually one of those things when it comes to maintenance where we have to make sure that the technicians have to release them and then replace them or put them back on I know this is very difficult to do I've tried it and I've done it and it's really really hard to do because generally it's one-handed work um, and then working against the the friction of the uh, springs or the tension of the damper uh, and to hold it, it's, it's really those days you got to hold everything just right to get that link back in place. And again, they also consist of an access door to inspect. Okay, what I wanted to say here is that if you look here at this picture, um, Okay, sorry about that pause there. But if you look at this picture and, and you look at the stamper, uh, one of the things that you really, that stands out to you is this driven bar actuator. And then when you look at the actuator over here, you see the motor. Um, typically when you see a motor, you're gonna, this is gonna be a combination damper, and we'll talk about that again when we talk about combination smoke and fire and smoke dampers. Uh, and again, it's, it's set up sometimes, you, they use it interchangeably. This could be called just a fire damper, or it could be a combo smoke fire damper. When you do your inventory, you have to be very specific because depending upon what it is will depend on what ne needs to be inspected. Over here is more of a traditional uh, fire damper only. You can see here you have your veins, uh, vertical veins going up and down. Um, and then you have, in this image over here, it points to the fusible link. So there's the link right there. It's holding back the door, if you will. And <clears throat> what happens is when that link breaks, this thing is going to come down and it's going to seal um, some of the critical dimensions and we'll talk about this in a, in a little bit uh, has to do with you know how far in now we're going to touch in on the, um, the codes the related to uh, fire dampers now the international building code and we've uh, talked about the IBC and how it, it came together to from various other dampers. code agencies um, several years ago um, it is the, the major player in the industry I know that in healthcare we focus a lot on NFPA and rightfully so because um, they, they, they are often very much specific for the healthcare industry and um, so we tend to pay real close attention to them especially as facility managers but when it comes to construction and design the IBC really is um, you know the, the big dog in the country. And I know that myself as a healthcare facilities manager in the time that I was there, I, I really didn't spend a lot of time with IBC. Um, but again, the IBC and the NFPA, they're trying to work together here to create more of a unified code. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I think that um, while I think we still need to major on NFPA and at the same time, you know, start majoring on IBC, but they definitely um, have code written for dampers. Um, just like the NFPA does and in some cases they're right in line with each other and, and in some cases they, they, they're not. The International Mechanical Code again not very familiar with that but it definitely they have a, a large uh, impact when it comes to the um, installation design and maintenance of dampers. Now we're getting into the code sections that we are very familiar with um, you know NFPA 90A and the reason why it is uh, involved here with, with fire and smoke dampers is because very often dampers are installed in ventilation systems um, and because it's inside that ductwork of course it's critical it's critical for the installers to understand how those how ductwork interfaces with dampers 
Now, 80 is really the meat and potatoes for the FM professional. You know, we need to continue to grow our understanding and awareness of this document, especially in light of what's going on with fire doors in recent years. I mean, it's really becoming the next big wave of code and standard focus um, right on the tails of and with you know, ventilation and air exchanges and such. But AD is becoming a document we're going to have to become very familiar with because when it comes to uh, dampers and doors and glazing and windows, it now seems to be a major, major focus. And we're going to spend some time in, in AD in this module, if you haven't already. Some of the code details are the general details that uh, it's good for us to just kind of know on top of our head. Uh, that fire dampers are recorded in two hour wall, rated walls in, in fully sprinkler buildings. Um, they're required in one hour rated walls in non fully sprinkled buildings. You'll see a lot of these when it comes to old um, construction um, in hazardous rooms, which is really, um, you know, one of the one of the big differences between the old and new construction. You know, in old construction, you had to have fire rated walls with dampers in the rooms. Uh, which required, you know, a lot more maintenance, a lot more construction costs. Um, but now, um, with sprinkled buildings, you don't necessarily have to have fire-rated walls anymore in all of these these hazardous spaces. You can have, depending upon the space, maybe a linen room, um, a storage room, things like that. They can be smoke-rated uh, or partitions if they're sprinkled, which really lessens the requirements and the expense of those spaces. Another thing is that, there, and this is uh, there's required testing 12 months after install. And there's a little caveat with this that we got to remember, especially when you're dealing with new construction. Um, and that is that often when they're installed, does not correlate at all when the building opens. And in fact, installation can occur many, many months before the building goes into surface and before the building is turned over to the maintenance department. And this has caused problems in our profession because let's say that they're installed, you know, eight or nine months before you actually take occupancy of the building or longer. Um, it's even possible that the installation may have occurred a couple of years before you actually get occupancy of the building if it's a large project, a large construction. And so you need to check with your AHJ. I mean, for me, I would say that at the point that occupancy certificate is given, that would be a fair date for the timer to start, you know, versus when it was actually physically installed. And it's a small thing, but it's, it can be a major headache because I think we would all assume that it's going to be based upon occupancy. Um, and so I think that's something to ha just have clarity with, with your authorities having jurisdiction, you know, before you, um, you know, even take control of the building. Then after that, it's every four years thereafter, except for hospitals. So if you have a lot of outpatient buildings and you have, you know, dampers, well, guess what? Every four years still. Um, but in the hospital itself, you get away with six years. Now, this is important uh, when it comes to especially um, occupancies of your buildings. If you have mixed use occupancies, it's pretty easy. It's going to be every six years. But what if you don't have mixed use? What if you have fire barriers that have created completely separate occupancies? And by life safety drawing, your hospital, while you may have four or five different occupancies connected to the same roof and under the same building, because of fire code, they are separate. So, you know, you get in a situation where you might have to have part of your buildings done every four years, and then other part that's really considered healthcare hospital done every six years. Something to consider as you're considering your, your, your occupancy of those buildings attached to you um, and to your facility and how they're designed. So, so something just to keep in mind. Um, and of course, there's big dollars uh, really over time to be saved by doing it um, every six years versus every four. Um, must be inventory, it's a unique ID type and location. This is, I think, one of those weaknesses we have. I think that by most part, we kind of know where they are generally. Um, and, but I don't know, we necessarily always know the type. You know, we don't always determine what type of damper it is. And, and that can get us obviously into, into some trouble especially when it comes to the report anymore that they're looking at. Because they want to see that, um, was there a feasible link or was there a, um, you know, a smoke control, uh, a d controller on it. Um, and of course, unique ID is, is obvious, but at the same time, you know, we need to have a thorough inventory. And again, I'll take just a second here to talk about inventory. You know, I think at the end of the day, uh, as, as a facility manager who's going to be ahead of the curve, you know, we probably ought to pretty much inventory as much as reasonably possible. I, I, I don't I don't think arguing the point anymore that, um, you know, we can't possibly inventory everything 
it's going to be a good argument, you know, going down the road, unless it's truly like in a business occupancy where there's no patient care and it's, you know, again, it's really just a low risk environment. But when it comes to being inside the hospital, I think that we need to have an inventory or pretty much doggone everything. Um, it's not convenient, that's for sure. But again, if you take it in small chunks over time, you know, you can have everything inventoried and therefore assess things in or out of the maintenance schedule and not have to deal with this question of inventory, you know, what's on the inventory, what's not on the inventory. So it's heading that way. Might as well go there before they force us to do that. And then we start getting gigged on accreditation surveys because of that. Um, here's a couple of examples of fire dampers installed. And again, one of the things I wanted to show you more real specifically was this access door. Um, you can see the damper here. You can tell the damper is in the wall. You can see the sleeve around the wall there. Um, here's another one of a damper that is just pulling air straight through. It's not actually um, in ductwork. Um, again, you can see that it's concrete sealed around it. Um, I, I'm assuming that this here is somehow breakaway in some fashion or form. Again, looking at it doesn't seem like it is, um, which might be a cause for concern on this image. But this is really just showing some examples of dampers. One thing that um, you know is, is um, you know we don't always have the luxury for sure in healthcare to have this kind of access uh, completely. You know, no cables, no pipes. You know, here's a little pipe over here. Usually, when we look above our ceilings and we look at our dampers, um, they're a lot harder to get to. Uh, than this. Now, in this drawing here, I, I just wanted you to kind of sometimes when it looks when most dampers, if you're going to find them, you're going to find them on your mechanical drawings, and it's going to be on your HVAC drawings. And one thing I just wanted you to to look here. This looks really busy, and it is. It, it seems kind of busy, and actually, I think by ductwork standards, it's not that busy. But what you want to do when you're looking for dampers, of course, is you want to find the firewall. So that that's like the key is finding your firewall. And once you find your firewall, then it becomes pretty easy. You just sort of travel along, and then you kind of move along, and then you go, oh, okay, wait, what's, what's this? Well, those are going, you know, through, but maybe, you know, those are not required, and there's a reason for that. I think that's because um, that is not going out into the space. That's just coming from some equipment. Um, but then if you go further, also you see this duck, and you see this little FD fire damper. And then you see right there, you know, um, your detail, a little bit of detail for the damper. And if you go a bit further and you see this is just an intake, so it's kind of a plenum space. So it's just pulling air right through out of the, out in the space. This one is going through, here's an, there's the FD again. And this one is tied to a closed duct system or return system. So um, it, it's a little different. In fact, let me back up over here, that's the supply duct, so it's pushing air out actually. Um, but anyway, so you see, you see, um, you can find the dampers. There's just two of them. Um, it'd be nice, I guess, uh, to have an ID for the dampers on drawings, but unfortunately, you know, that's not typically done. Uh, maybe something that will change in the future so that we can actually have our uh, IDs drawn up from the engineers when they actually design stuff. So, but anyway, but there's there's two dampers. Keep going, and you don't see any more. So there's your fire dampers. And I just wanted you to see an example of a drawing. Um, and again, typically they are identified by the, the letters FD. Um, now we're getting to smoke dampers. Um, smoke dampers, again, very similar. They prevent the passage of smoke through a ductwork opening or air opening in a smoke barrier or smoke partition. It can be installed in horizontal floor or vertical wall openings and can be combined with a fire damper uh, or, quote, they would be called a fire slash smoke damper. Um, one of the things, one of the caveats about smoke and fire dampers to keep in mind is that, um, and I don't introduce it here, I'll introduce it when we talk about barrier management and walls more, but we're gonna, you know, there's a, th there's a term called intumescent, um, and that term intumescent has to do with the fire material that is put around, um, if you will, um, a holes or penetrations. And typically that is the red stuff, uh, typically, not always, but it's typically the red stuff. But intumescent material has a unique characteristic that when it gets hot, it expands and it seals. And so when it comes to a fire, that makes a lot of sense. You know, when you think about fire dampers, you think, okay, yeah, you know, it's going to be hot. And that's what's going to cause that 165 degree fusible link to, you know, to break or to melt. And you're going to get your dampers to close. Um, and that's wonderful and that's good. But I think that a little interesting piece to understand is that when it comes to a fire damper, 
um, if you look at code, you don't necessarily have to be able to, um, when you're using intermescent material, you don't necessarily have to have a complete seal around the space of the penetration with intermescent material. You know, there's, you know, I think there's a misunderstanding out there that if you can shine a light through the hole, then it's a violation. Um, and if you can't see light, then you're good. Well, guess what? That's not true. Because when it comes to a fire damper, and again, this is the reason why I need to distinguish between the two. When it comes to a fire damper or a fire wall, um, if it's using intermescent material, when it gets hot, it will seal. In fact, think about it. A lot of these um, inserts that we have today that um, um, that are either bricks or that are uh, the they're, they're, they're like they're like I can't think what they call them, but they they seal and they hold. They're like a uh, insert, and they open up more and more and more as you push pipes and cables through. You you they're not completely sealed between those cables and stuff. It doesn't seal. But what happens is they have intermescent material, so when they get hot, it seals. Now. When it comes to a smoke damper, that's not the case because as you know, with smoke, smoke is not necessarily going to be hot. In fact, it's, it, it's not going to melt um, anything. So when it comes to smoke, it's very different. When you have a smoke damper or a combination smoke fire damper, now you do have to be sure that there is no gap and there is no light um, going through. Uh, in fact, when it comes to smoke dampers, you don't necessarily have to use, you know, fire caulking and fire material. When it comes to smoke, uh, or smoke damper purely, you just need something that can uh, resist the passage of smoke. So you can use drywall material or caulkings and things like that, um, and not necessarily have to use um, fire material. But when you get to the combination damper, again, that does shift again. It's, it takes the, the most restrictive um, thing. So in that case, you'd have both a combination of fire and smoke. So you both have to have intermescent material along with it has to be sealed if it's going to be a combination. I hope that makes sense. It's a clarification that, you know, I learned along the way that I didn't really think about. You know, it came along the lines of, well, it's all just red stuff. But I thought I'll repeat that again when we do the barrier management and the barrier in the wall um, discussion. Um, but I just wanted to touch base on you. I think it helps to maybe say that a few times. And again, we're going to touch on it briefly because, of course, when it comes to dampers, they're going to be going through uh, smoke barriers or smoke partitions um, and fire barriers. Now, smoke barriers or smoke partition, we, you know, we need to differentiate between the two. Um, it's very important. Um, and again, they're very different life safety building features when it comes down to it. I think that I, I know that early on in my career, I used them interchangeably. Um, I know that in, there are some nuances between the IBC and the NFPA when it comes to smoke barriers and fire barriers. Um, but uh, the NFPA pretty much really has three levels. There's fire barrier, smoke barrier, and smoke partition. And that's kind of where I'm going to hang my hat for our conversation um, in this course. So smoke barrier, um, when you come to a smoke barrier, it is part of what creates what's called compartmentalization. And um, compartmentalization is when you're dividing the building into safe havens, if you will. In other words, when there's a fire, you, the people in occupying the space need to be able to move horizontally first from one part of the hospital to another part of the healthcare facility, if you will, um, to be protected from the smoke, because that's the killer. And so these partitions, uh, or I'm sorry, smoke barriers, they run from uh, floor to deck and they go from wall to wall, exterior wall to exterior wall. And it's very, very important that, you know, uh, there is at least, in fact, it's required that there's at least two smoke compartments per floor because you need to have a horizontal place you can go so you don't have to go vertically. Um, it is dangerous to take patients and people up and down steps um, because of the physical mobility issues and other issues, equipment and otherwise. So the goal is to never have them leave the floor, if at all possible, the first goal. So that's why you create smoke barriers from wall to wall. Now, smoke partitions are slightly different. Um, and, 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 well, and, and they're similar, but very different. Um, the, the smoke partition you know, is there to protect if you will, smoke from getting out of a space or getting two people in a smaller space. So
So you can think of smoke partitions as more of like a box, a smaller box. It's the box within the box. So smoke partitions is inside of the smoke barriers. They don't generally necessarily have to go to the ceiling depending upon the design of your facility and your ceiling and um, whether you have sprinklers or don't have sprinklers. But the smoke partition is just a box that is the smaller box that is inside and in between your smoke barriers in your facility. And they do have, there are some, you know, there is some, it's relaxed a little bit more. Again, very, very specifically, many times smoke partitions do not have to go to the deck. And, you know, um, and, and going back to what I said earlier, I made a comment here, but I said earlier is that fire caulk and smoke rated walls, can, can there be a gap? Um, when it comes to, again, to smoke barriers or smoke partitions, there cannot be a gap. This is when you, but you can use other material. You don't have to use the expensive, you know, red caulk stuff, if you will. You can use other material to just prevent it, from, prevent smoke from passing through. So that's, that's one savings that you can do. The other thing when it comes to smoke partitions, of course, they don't necessarily have to go to the deck, which is a huge issue when it comes to pulling cables and wiring those areas in between the smoke barriers. I mean, um, we probably do waste a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money because we don't know the difference. And we just decide that we're gonna go ahead and treat everything like a smoke barrier and we're gonna put red stuff everywhere. And, and, and again, it's, it seems like a good idea, but we're not doing ourselves a service and we're making our work a lot harder. So it's very important to do that. And then I make a comment here about to derate or not to derate. Um, you know, as you upgrade your construction and as you um, change your facility and add sprinklers or whatever you do, um, you have the opportunity to derate, if you will, walls. You know, some walls might go from a smoke barrier to a smoke partition. Um, or in some cases, you might not need smoke partitions anymore because of what you've done in your building. And it's very important that when, when you do derate that you take the time to update your drawings and you take the time to um, you know, make sure you, you, you take out or uh, remove equipment that was in those walls previously because there are a lot of cases where people will derate a wall but they will leave the damper or they'll leave certain things up in the ceiling and because they're there you're still required to test them and inventory them and take care of them so it can be very helpful uh, and it certainly can um, can certainly reduce your amount of work that you have to do but you have to be, stay up on your drawings and you have to stay up on understanding what you need to do with the equipment that is inside of those spaces Okay, well, let's continue talking about smoke barriers. Um, devise a building into sections to contain the migration of smoke. Sounds pretty good, right? And we talked about how we have to have compartmentalization, two of them per floor in healthcare, um, so people can egress to. Um, it provides barriers between the building exterior walls and from floor slab to floor roof deck. Again, this is a very critical feature, and I think this is the one that gets us in the most trouble because of course you know we're pretty good i guess going from uh, floor to ceiling and then once we start to get above the ceiling that's where we have all our issues and we really need to have control and at some point we'll talk again more about above ceiling permits but again um, if you don't have a good above ceiling permit program then you're just destined to fail again and again and again and i'll stress above ceiling permit programs are for anybody anybody that moves a ceiling tile and that means everybody and I think that's our big challenge I think too often we've, we've become too comfortable in our buildings and we just don't monitor it well and uh, I, I just don't think anyone should move a ceiling tile including a surveyor when it comes to above ceiling um, another little caveat when it comes to um, you know about above, above ceiling and 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 this issue um, well actually I, I, I don't recall what I was gonna say just now but uh, um, hmm. Oh yes, I remember now. Um, you know, this is one of those little caveats that happens uh, in older buildings, and that is that there are buildings that were designed where the ceiling uh, was designed to be an actual smoke barrier, um, and those are like metal pan ceilings. Um, and very often, even then, you'll find that above those pan ceilings, um, there is. Uh, um, the the beam the beams and stuff don't have fireproofing on them um, now that's not common in many places but it's still out there and 
I've heard of folks making the mistake of replacing their pan ceiling with standard tile or drop-in ceiling and then next thing you know they have a major 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 barrier issue uh, because of that so I don't know that you would run into that very often anymore but in, it's something worth mentioning I did have a building like that um, again required in hospitals and nursing homes typically one hour rated and um, openings may be rated as low as 20 minutes so um, and that's also another confusion and it's kind of interesting because typically your doors have a rating that's less than the walls um, you know you'll see one hour walls with uh, you know 45 minute or 30 minute doors and um, you see two hour walls with hour and a half uh, you know firewalls with hour and a half fire doors and and that's really common and, and so you know I think that's uh, maybe that's should be a common sense um, understanding in a profession but it's not I mean I, I guess that you know it, it it's something that needs to be understood that you're often going to have doors that are rated less uh, than the walls. Um, a smoke partition, again, it's a barrier to present the passage of smoke. Um, and it does not run between building exteriors and walls and usually encloses corridors um, that are non in a non-sprinkled building. And again, I had a facility like that where, again, it was the wall and all the corridors where we didn't have sprinklers had to be maintained from floor to deck in the partition. Uh, because we had a drop in ceiling. Um, again, in, in, in current code with enclosed sprinklers, um, with spaces that are enclosed with, with sprinklers, the hazardous spaces can be partitions. Uh, again, in old school, a lot of spaces were fire rated and um, you had fire rated walls to the deck. However, when it comes to sprinkled facilities now, which is more commonly the case, these spaces like storage and soil utility and clean linen and similar can be a partition instead of a smoke uh, barrier to the ceiling. So, uh, so uh, something else to, to, to keep in mind, um, or if, I'm sorry, fire rated barrier to the ceiling. So that's another thing to keep in mind. It lowers the cost of construction. And again, it's a, it's a benefit to know the difference. Components of a smoke damper. So now we're gonna go back to uh, smoke dampers and try to get a better understanding of a smoke damper. Again, very similar to a fire damper, although the, the little differences are very critical. Um, again, has a sleeve. Um, the smoke blades are parallel blades. It's an important distinction. Um, breakaway joints, duct-mounted smoke detector. Uh, again, keeping in mind that when you have a, um, a damper, a smoke damper, it, it needs to detect smoke. It may be stating the obvious, but you know that smoke detector needs to detect smoke, and so uh, in order to you know move the actuator. Um, a related piece of equipment is the interface module. You know, many old school um, smoke detectors um, and old school designs of um, smoke detectors that are tied to dampers, smoke dampers, is they were isolated. They, they really, they weren't tied back to the fire panel. And they, were, they operated independently, if you will, or locally. And anymore, um, those units, those devices need to be tied back to the fire panel through what's called an IM or interface module. And that module has a, um, a couple of requirements. One is its location. And you'll find and see, and I think some future code here, where you, you know, they, they allow the interface module to be used to satisfy the requirement for how close you are um, to the duct detector. Um, as well as the, um, the, the, the smoke detector as well. Also, the um, smoke damper has a damper actuator, and typically it's a motorized or a pneumatic actuator that actually is used to physically close, close the door. Um, access door and ductwork, uh, again, and a fusible link is found on combination fire smoke dampers. So you may see something that has both. It has an actuator, and it also has a fusible link if it's a combination unit. And a pretty classic uh, smoke damper. Um, this one here you can see um, has the actuator on it and has the, um, um, the, well this one doesn't actually, well it does have the sleeves that go on the wall but also it has the um, blades, the parallel blades. This one here is one that has, if you look at it, you can see the um, actual smoke detector um, right on it and it's tied to over here you got your actuator and uh, again this one being sized 
looks like to be inside of a, a duct. Okay. Now some of the codes as it relates, um, International Building Code, we talked about that already, and International Mechanical Code. Again, NFPA 90A, uh, which we talked about previously, which has to do with HVAC um, and the installation within HVAC systems. NFPA 72, now this you didn't see this with the fire because the fire damper uh, doesn't have a smoke detector tied to it. It's a fusible link. But because you have smoke detection, you're gonna, you know, NFPA is gonna be, 72 is gonna be tied to um, smoke dampers or combination dampers because of the detector. Um, NFPA 80, again, we did talk about that before, um, standard toward fire doors and other opening protective devices, um, installation, testing, and maintenance. So these are the specific codes, and again, we're going to spend some time in NFPA 80 more than the other ones, but uh, it's good to know the code that are tied to it. Now some code specifics, uh, smoke detector shall be less than five feet from damper. Um, and actually, this is a little different than the, I believe this is the IBC five feet and the FPA is three or it's vice versa. I think I mentioned that a little bit. Uh, no branch ductwork between the detector and the damper. This is a very important thing to understand for maintenance and operations. Um, there may be a tendency due to access to try to access the, the, the duct work between the detector and the damper because, you know, it's just convenient to get to. Well, you, you cannot do that. You have to access it, you know, before the smoke detector. Um, except for smoke control systems, all smoke dampers are required to close during fan shutdown, except, except, and a very important exception, when the smoke detector does not require a minimum air velocity in order to function. And this other one is equally uh, important. Duct-mounted smoke detectors are not required if the areas of the building are served by HVAC already, served by HVAC already have area smoke detectors damper controlled by area detectors. So, um, you know, you can, you can get away from having the, again, if you have a, a smoke detector in the area, uh, then you can get away from the, uh, th that goes back and controls, then you can get away from the duct mounted units, which is pretty, pretty, pretty common, uh, commonly done. So some of the, over some of the nuances. Um, air handling units larger than 15,000 CFM shall be isolated with smoke dampers in both the supply and return duct. Um, AHU serving one floor are exempt. Don't forget to verify air handler smoke damper shutdown devices that may not be connected to the fire panel. Now, earlier we talked about devices being required through an IM connected to the fire panel, but you know I believe you may still find out there that there are some duct detectors that are there to sh for sh air handler shutdown that are localized and not tied back to the fire panel. Um, I know I had a situation, and this not may this may not be the case. In fact. Um, I think this would need to fall under your statement of condition on, on a PFI for joint commission, um, or you need to be cited as a variance if you don't have this. But I, I have had, a, my last facility was like this, where my um, duct detectors, or, or shutdown detectors, uh, were isolated. They were, they were um, localized, and they were not tied back to my fire panel. And uh, therefore, when the um, testing company was testing my equipment, they only tested those things that were addressable to my fire panel. And because my shutdown devices were not tied to my fire panel, they didn't test them. And I did get gigged on that during a survey once, and but we corrected that. Um, NFPA 72, smoke detectors or IM shall be within three feet of smoke damper. Again, this is that clarification. I guess IBC is five feet, but NFPA is three feet. So if you go with three feet, you'll be safe. Um, duct mounted smoke detectors must have their own address that can be controlled by fire panel. And again, that goes back to what I said a moment ago about having a S, uh, PFI or um, you know, a life safety variance um, if you have IMs that are not tied to your shutdown devices or smoke detectors. And um, I wanted to show you a couple of damper install issues, uh, which again, it's amazing. Probably some of you listening to me today who have had life safety surveys for um, decades um, and damper inspections, you know, truly, um, it's almost like you really need to take a picture of every damper like this um, and document it. And it's probably not a bad idea. And I think there are companies out there that do that um, so that you can physically see the condition of the dampers. Um, I don't know, um, this may or may not be newer construction, 
but you can see here looking at the damper uh, very clearly where you know you got your damper installation but yet here's the gap um, and, and who knows how long it's been like this another uh, and this is a horizontal installation um, on the floor um, it's funny I, I had something like this occur but it occurred after construction and it was actually after a joint commission survey and it actually occurred with the building official during the uh, state survey or the CMS survey, uh, the validation survey, where he was all over the building and he crawled in all kinds of spaces and he got behind an air handler um, in a corner and there was a duct, a damper going through the floor and had something just like this where he saw a gap. And, uh, you know, uh, so you'd be surprised about the due diligence when it comes to, you know, your building. Uh, this is pretty common, unfortunately. Um, the these are these are access points. You know, how can someone inspect this damper here if you've got this bar right across the door? Um, chances are it's not going to be inspected. In fact, there's a possibility it may have never been inspected. But again, I wonder what the report says when you look at this. And of course, here's cabling. You know, again, with with the world of information technology, you know, and the number of cables we have in our ceilings. Um, this is just not uncommon, you, you know, especially when you get near um, firewalls and smoke walls. Um, what's going to happen is, is that the cables are going to start collecting themselves to the best pass-through location by the wall. And unfortunately, that's very often right next to the ductwork. And, and if it's next to the ductwork, then there's a chance you're going to block your access door. And how are you going to get through there you know and these look like some pretty bright shiny yellow cables so probably wasn't done that long ago so this pretty much concludes this presentation on dampers again we're going to look at NFPA 80 we'll be studying dampers uh, you'll be listening to a couple more presentations we do the walls and we're going to do the doors and give you a nice comprehensive understanding of the barrier management systems hope you enjoyed it and uh, look forward to continuing to work with you in the future mm.